Hello, uh, welcome to Psych 109, Human Growth and Development. We're going to be covering Chapter 1 in this video PowerPoint. We're going to start off by defining what lifespan psychology is. It is the field of study that examines the behavioral patterns and trends that occur through a person's life. And specifically, we examine growth, change, and stability. So most things in our lives can be divided into one of those three concepts. Now, in the olden days, the theory was that people were either shaped by their environment, otherwise known as nurturing, or shaped by their biology, in other words, nature. And this battle between nature and nurture uh, was seen as the only two options. Now, more recently, people have become to understand that <clears throat> our personalities, who we are as people, are a product of both nature and nurture. So instead of an or, it's an and. So the new idea, which is nature plus nurture, equals the biopsychosocial model. And this little cartoon over here, Trevor was raised by wild sloths is kind of the uh, epitome of what you would think of with nurture in sense in terms that a man would sleep like that because he was raised by sloths. So let's look at the biopsychosocial model in more detail. Lifespan development is the product of interaction of biological, psychological, and social forces. So when we look at biological, we things like we see things like genetics, disabilities, our physical health, to a certain extent our IQ even, um, because we are born with a certain IQ that can in fact be affected significantly, not just by being in a good environment where mom and dad read to their child and ensure that they have every opportunity, but also you have situations where nutrition, for example, plays a huge role in the development of one's intellectual ability because if they're not getting the fuel, their brains are not working correctly. In terms of the psychological, we see things like self-esteem, coping skills, social skills, how we think, the way we develop our ideas. And then lastly, we have our social issues, our peers, our family, our school, all of those things shape us as human beings. By understanding this model, we can explain how human development builds and evolves. So when we look at the biological, again, genes, hormones, healthcare, psychological forces, our personality and our cognition, and our social forces, all three of these things create you, which means that everyone is unique in the sense that no one really has exactly the exact same biology, the exact same psychology, nor the exact same social influence. Even people who grow up in the same family <clears throat> oftentimes can be very different. For example, being the firstborn in a family is going to have a much different experience than being the middle child or the baby of the family. And so, for example, firstborns tend to be more independent, babies tend to be more dependent, the middle children tend to. Um, be more social because they're looking for attention and as a consequence to all of these even if somebody has the same parents grew up in the same house their experiences could be potentially very different so what is the purpose of lifespan psychology we study it to offer an organized account of development across the lifespan to identify the interconnections between earlier and later events. So what we're really looking at are the transitions that we celebrate in our lives. And we usually do this with rites of passage. When a baby is born and they are born to a Christian um, household, they are baptized. Jewish kids go through a bar or bat mitzvah. 
Jewish or uh, Catholic children are confirmed at age 14. And then the vast majority of people in this country get married. And of course, everyone at some point dies and there is some sort of celebratory goodbye or funeral. And it is very different from culture to culture, but there seems to be this um, consistent need to mark these rites of passage. We also look at lifespan psychology to account for the mechanisms responsible for lifespan development. So for example, research shows that what happened at a young age affects a person later on, often crossing into other areas. So some of the more recent research that has been done, um, attractive young people generally develop good self-esteem, giving them better self-esteem than the general public as they get to be older adults. Um, another very well-known research study shows that children who are abused are more likely to abuse children as adults. It doesn't mean that it's definitely going to happen, but they are more likely. And then we also look at how the biological, psycho psychological, and social factors shape an individual's development. When we look at lifespan development, it gives us an opportunity to isolate one particular element and see how that affects their development overall. So if we were to look at, for example, um, potty training and how the potty training has a specific effect on a child, we can then see if it's a positive experience, a negative experience, a stressful experience, and how that shaped that person's personality as they grew up. So let's look at some of the history of child rearing because developmental or lifespan psychology is a relatively new field. And one of the reasons it's such a new field is because parenting was much different up until about 100 years ago. So let's start back in the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages run approximately 800 to the 1300s. The Catholic Church was the dominant force of the day, and they discouraged family planning, so there were very high birth rates. Women would often give birth to 12 or 14 children in their lifetime. And again, you know, life expectancy in those days was around 35 to 40. You have to remember that all of the healthcare advances that have occurred in the 20th century, the 1900s, vaccines, penicillin, being able to do heart surgery, being able to manage diabetes, all of these things are modern developments. And when you look back to 100 years ago compared to 1,200 years ago, there's going to be a significant difference in what was being done for children. Um, the high rates of mortality, three out of five children died before reaching adulthood, 60%. So parenting was very different because you couldn't really get attached to these children. The vast majority of them would die before they hit eight or nine years old. Um, so because of that, affection was not something that was seen very often. Um, you know, you separate yourself from a child because you know that they may not survive to adulthood and if everybody is doing it that's the norm now in these days adulthood started around age seven or eight in terms of working boys were apprenticed out for trades or worked the farm and girls were betrothed to their future husband and worked the farm they got married when puberty hit so when a girl got her first menstrual cycle that pretty much indicated she was ready to get married then we're gonna jump to the Renaissance which runs from about 1300 to the 1600s the Renaissance is characterized by a period of rebirth of learning and culture and society people began to think about their place in the world as they did this, people began to see themselves as individuals, and they also began to see their children as individuals with rights. In 1693, John Locke, who is the philosopher, that's him over here looking very serious, um, he developed a theory called tabula resa, which is Latin for the words blank slate. 
And what he said was that our brains are empty at birth, like a bucket waiting to be filled with everything that we experience at home, at school, in the job, and essentially we are products of our social environment. And this in turn gave parents and teachers the understanding that they can control the child's experiences by what they write or add to that quote unquote blank slate. Parents and family members therefore have the ability to shape the personality of their child. This was the first time that childhood was seen as a developmental stage. So the major consequences is that society saw the value of showing affection to children. So again, you know, we're talking about traditional parenting really not coming into place until the late 16 or 1700s. And even then, it wasn't like it is today. This is all very important because this represented the first time it was recognized that childhood was a separate developmental phase. Then we're going to jump to the industrial age and this runs from the late 1700s to the late 1800s. This was the rise of the age of machinery. People were moving from rural areas to cities because jobs were available in the cities. Urbanization changed the world from a barter economy where you were going to trade the um, sheep wool that you sheared that morning for food or for a new horseshoe. Instead, now you're going to a cash economy. Children were seen as an economic asset and they were put to work in factories to help support the family when they were about seven years old. And the reason that they were put so easily into the factories is that they could do the jobs that adult sized people could not do. So for example you'll see a picture up here and you have the young boys standing on the actual loom. This is a fabric loom creating um, swatches of fabric and they would clear the loom as it came back and forth because of their size. They could stand on the machinery and uh, work the clearing section. Here's a picture of young children who were working at the end of the 1800s and then this is my particular favorite is a young girl pulling a bucket filled with coal through a small shaft um, that clearly would have been very difficult for an adult to do. Then we're going to go to the beginning of the 1900s. End of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, we call this the modern age and this is when the wives of factory owners and social rights crusaders were able to enact child labor laws. These child labor laws went into effect in the late 19th century and they basically said that children under the age of 16 could not work in factories. And to this age, to this day, if you want your child to work on your farm, that's fine, but they cannot work in a factory until they're at least 16. Now what happens when all of a sudden all these kids are pushed out of the factories and have nothing to do? We're going to talk about this in a second, but first we want to look at that these child labor laws were the first time childhood became a legal definition. Not just an understanding, not just a developmental phase, but a legal definition. And this led to the development of compulsory education. To contain the multitudes of children in urban areas, schools were built. At first, only Sunday school was mandatory for children to be moral citizens. But eventually, subjects evolved into academics and it became compulsory or mandatory. Around World War II, the idea that adulthood started at 18 was recognized. And that was due largely um, for um, the draft and people going to war. Um, and they felt that 18 was a much more appropriate age than 16. Adolescence as a stage became a recognized stage of um, development in the early 20th century. Um, and one of the characteristics that is very, very precise is that adolescence begins with biology, meaning the puberty 
the hair growing, the boobs growing, various um, changes in your voice or your body, uh, girls developing their menstrual cycle, and ends in the cultural recognition of adulthood. When you're 18, you are considered an adult by the legal forces, by your mom and dad probably, by your teachers, and as such, it is this society looking at you saying, well, you're an adult, now what? And what happens is relationships with the family shift, and your peers are the most important people in your life during your adolescence. And that allows you as a 18 or 19 year old to be able to leave home if you should want to and do your own thing because you have separated from mom and dad emotionally if not physically. So the vast majority of what we're going to be looking at in this class is how we change and that's the definition of development is how we change. We don't look at age alone, but age provides us a rough estimate. So when we look at these developmental stages, keep in mind that they're estimates. They're not exact. For example, some children are potty trained before 18 months. Some children need to be potty trained well after three years of age. Um, some kids begin puberty at nine or 10 years old. Other children, their puberty doesn't start till 14. So we look at things in an average. We're not looking to say everybody fits into this particular category. Remember, at every stage, there's going to be exceptions to the rule. This is what our first quiz will be on. And uh, if you have any questions, please text me or email me. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed this PowerPoint. Thank you.